Hey, last time we looked at Revelation chapter 10, the whole chapter. One of the first things we talked about is who this angel is, who John had an encounter with, who spoke something, had a little book in his hand. I talked about how I believe it's not Jesus, but some other angel. I simply don't like the description of this angel being Jesus when he's described as just another mighty angel. Um, In my opinion, he's not high and lifted up enough in this passage to be considered as Jesus. And when you read other scriptures of Jesus through scripture, he's not described in such a lowly way as he is here. At least not that I remember. Of course, there are similarities between the description here given of this angel, this messenger of God, and the description we see in Revelation chapter 1, which definitely is speaking of Jesus Christ. We call it the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. The one who holds the uh, seven churches in his, or he stands among the seven churches and holds the messengers of those churches in his hand. So these angels, in my opinion, are just, this angel right here is similar to Jesus uh, in his description because they are like him. Uh, they're holy beings. These angels, like Jesus, have never sinned. Uh, they're also messengers of the Father. Hey, yeah. Can I mention one, one yeah. thing that I was thinking about this? Yeah. I wouldn't normally. Yeah, sure. No, go, go for it. But um, I, I don't think this could be Jesus in any way because this angel in verse 6 swears by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it. And we know that Jesus created all things. Right. Right, like he's talking to a different person. Yeah, like he's talking about a different person, yeah. not himself. Yeah. Okay. Hello. I just wanted to add something. Uh, God in the Old Testament has sworn by himself before. Mm-hmm. So it's funny that that also. Yeah. But it seems like he's talking about a different person here. Right. He doesn't say he's swearing by himself. He says he's swearing by him who lives forever, like a third person. Uh, and then we talked about the little book, The Seven Thunders, and how the sealing up of this, this seven thunders, this little book, the contents of it is similar to what happened in Daniel chapter 12 and how that was sealed up. But the difference was that the sealing up in Daniel 12 was a sealing up not of the message itself, but of the understanding of the message. Whereas in this situation, the message itself is sealed up, which in my opinion tells me that the message of this little book would be much more clear much more easy to understand. It wouldn't require time to understand it. That the people, even when John wrote this, in the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, would be able to understand it. And they might take action too soon if they heard this message. This is most likely, in my opinion, why God sealed it up the way he did by not allowing John to reveal it to the readers of Revelation. And we talked about the no more delay, the mystery being finished. With the delay of God's wrath has end. We saw this in the fifth seal. How, you know, how long, O Lord, will you delay the vengeance upon the people who put us to death? He told them to wait a little while longer. But the delay has come to an end now because we're at the very end. We're getting close to the seventh trumpet, which is the end. And uh, God is going to unleash his wrath upon the Antichrist and those who sided with him. Um, The trying and testing time of the Jewish people and the true saints of God has come to an end. We see this in Matthew 24 when he says if he did not stop it, did not put it to an end at that point in time, he did it for the sake of the elect. Um, The return of Jesus has come. There's no more delay in that. It's now going to come. The time of the resurrection has come, which is the same thing as the mystery being uh, finished. Uh, because the re- plan of redemption, which is not just a redemption of our, of our morality, the way we live our lives, not the redemption of just our soul or our spirit, but the redemption of our bodies. The Bible says in Romans 8, the creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God. And not only them, but their g- creation itself, even though it's personified in that verse, doesn't really groan. It has birth pangs like the, the tremors of the earth, the earthquakes, the tsunamis and things that happen in the earth. That will come to an end too because it will be refreshed. It will be renewed at the revealing of the sons of God. It will not be subjected to those things any longer. 
And so we, Brother Kevin brought up in 1 Corinthians 15 that the, as the saints are risen from the grave, that is the end of the mystery of the redemption plan of God. Uh, and we see in 1 Corinthians 13 that we now see darkly, but then we shall see. Uh, not through a glass darkly, so see as he sees. And so the mystery will be finished. Um, and like I said uh, last time, mystery does not mean it can't be known. It means it's something that is not known at that time that can be revealed at a future time. We also talked about the squalling of the little book by John. It went back to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3 and compared it to what Ezekiel went through. And uh, how the, the messenger of God, that, that calling can be a sweet calling, but also a bitter calling. Um, there is a wonderful sense of fulfillment in obeying the call of God on your life. But at the same time, it's not easy because the world does not like you fulfilling the call of God on your life, no matter what it may be. In fact, me and Brother Tracy were talking about this yesterday on the way home from Memphis and how when you're out there preaching, because he, he hasn't had much opportunity to preach lately, so he's out there again, he's, he senses that fulfillment and doing what he's called to do. And we were talking about that and I told him how it's amazing to me that in the midst of all the, the chaos that goes around you when you're preaching, you know, people putting their finger inch from your nose and, and threatening to beat you up and women flashing their body parts at you and, and people just going in rages at you, threat, you know, threatening to kill you even, and that you can just be a complete peace of mind and calmness of spirit because you sense the wonderful fulfillment of you being what God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. And I brought up uh, to Bill Tracy uh, this movie he hasn't seen. I was surprised he hadn't seen it yet uh, called Chariots of Fire where Eric Little talks about this very thing. His sister would confront him because he was a missionary, confront him about being in the mission field and how he was going to run for the glory of God. And he told her, I sense the pleasure of God when I run. Because I believe God has made me for this purpose. And when I'm out there preaching the gospel, I sense the, the pleasure of God because I'm doing what he's called me to do. It's, it's similar to how I feel when, when I see my children walk in truth. That's, that's one of their purposes. I, I, I sense the, I have great pleasure in that. You know, when my children do what is right, I don't say I'm proud of you. Not that I think there's anything wrong with that, but I, I don't like to use that, that lingo, that language, that, that uh, terminology. I tell them I'm pleased with you. Because I am pleased with them when I see them walk in truth. I see them do what they're supposed to do. I see them increasing their prayer time. And I see them hungry for the word. And I see them zealous to go out there and hand out a gospel track or to share the gospel with the lost or to travel five hours and lose sleep and to go out there and experience the, the wickedness of the world to do what God has called us to do. And so that's the way I feel when I, I, I preach the word of God. And that's the sweetness of it. But the bitterness of it, the, the bitter pill of it, if you, if you may, is the way the world treats you in response to that. But uh, that's nothing compared to the sweetness of it, of course. So praise him that he's called us to such a calling. Surely we are all unworthy of it. Um, and we sense this pleasure of God even in the midst of affliction. And it's supernatural that we can be at peace and have a calmness of spirit during those times. In the last teaching, I also talked about how we are called to speak messages that oftentimes won't be received. We may even know ahead of time. God may even tell us ahead of time. This person's not going to receive your message, but you're required to tell it to them anyway. That's what he told Ezekiel. And there may be a message God wants you to share with someone else. And maybe one of the things that's deterring you from doing it is the fact that you don't think they'll respond positively to it. In fact, I talked to a guy yesterday who came up to me while I was preaching and talked about, you know, we talked about effectiveness and what that means and what it means to be effective as a gospel minister and, and how he used to kind of do what I did and then he just started praying for people and that's it and he was having great success and supposedly. And as I reasoned with him, I think what happened is he compromised. He didn't like the way the world was responding to his message. He didn't like that lots of people weren't getting saved. Uh, and uh, he said, you know what, I'm going to try a different way. And so basically he said, I'm smarter than God. 
uh, God's way wasn't working well, and so I'm going to try it my way because God tells me to preach, but you know, that's not working, God. So I'm smarter than you, I'm going to do it my way instead. And God forbid we do that because when God tells us to speak, we better speak, no matter what the response is, no matter what the potential response may be. We must speak. So we don't, we don't base the effectiveness of our preaching, of our ministry, uh, upon the success in getting people converted. Our success is based upon how faithful we are to God and his word. That's it. We don't, we don't preach for people. We preach for Jesus. We preach for an audience of one. And when we do it, we have that mindset, we won't compromise. We'll never compromise. Because God won't lead you to compromise. You're doing it for him, he won't lead you to compromise. You do it for somebody else, that leads to compromise. That's what happens. And then lastly, last, last time we talked about how John is most likely one of the two witnesses. Um, that uh, you know, he was given a message to swallow. And we saw the only other example we really have to compare us to Ezekiel. And, and when he was given that message to swallow, he spoke it. He didn't swallow a message that someone else spoke later on. He swallowed a message that he spoke. And I don't think it's any different with John. Uh, he, he swallowed the little book so he could speak its contents at some point in time. He didn't write it down because it wasn't for just anyone to read. I mean, this Bible, anyone can get a Bible. It's about anywhere in the world. Pick it up and read it. Really, anyone, I mean, people might understand it, but anyone can read what is written in Revelation. And if that would have been included in Revelation, anyone would be able to read it. So obviously it's not just for anyone. It's for a certain people at a certain time who John will speak to because he swallowed the message. And he's the one who will, in a sense, regurgitate it to other people that they may hear the message. And you know what? You may be one of the ones who hears that message. Not because you're special, more special, or God's playing favorites, but because you may be a Christian living at just the right time. At just the right time. Um, and then we also talked about that although it's possible, I don't think it's probable that uh, John could possibly be like a third witness that's not you know, maybe not one of the two witnesses, maybe it's Elijah and somebody else besides maybe it's Moses or Enoch. And, um, but John is maybe a third witness. And that's possible, I don't think it's probable, because I think the scripture, if there was going to be a third witness, you know, who's basically, you know, risen from the grave, so to speak, come back from the dead or come back from being, you know, taken up like Elijah was, you'd think we would know about it. And so I don't think that's actually what's going to happen. I think he's, he's probably going to be one of two witnesses. Okay, so let's move on to Revelation chapter 11 today. And we're going to read the first two verses. Revelation 11, verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So John is given a measuring rod to measure a temple, its court, or its altar, and those who worship there. But what temple is this? Uh, well, as you already know, the temple that John saw with his physical eyes, you know, when Jesus was on earth, and after Jesus left the earth, uh, that had been already destroyed by the time this book is written. Of course, preterists would have you believe otherwise, but they're wrong. Okay? Revelation was written around 96 AD. That's when he would have been at the, the island of Patmos. That's when the emperor of Rome instituted that kind of punishment for criminals. That's when he put them on Patmos to work the mines there as a punishment for whatever reason, they were, whatever thing they supposedly did wrong. So we talked about this earlier on in our study of Revelation, chapter 1, we talked about things like, I'm coming quickly, what these things mean, and we addressed preterism at that point in time, and how they try to say this book was written earlier than A.D. 70, which is simply not true. Um, but this, so this couldn't possibly be um, the second temple. Uh, really, the refurbished or updated second temple. It was actually, the second temple was was rebuilt after the captivity in Babylon for 70 years, but then it became refurbished or updated by Herod, 
who made it more greater and more magnificent in his eyes than it was to start out with. And that's the temple that was destroyed, the temple that Jesus walked in. Uh, it was destroyed at A.D. 70. And so that isn't this temple. He's not measuring that temple. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, if that was this temple, I don't think he would need a rod to measure it. Because Jews so treasured the temple, he would have already known the measurements. He wouldn't have to, he would have to go out and measure it. He would already know the measurements. You know, when he, when, by the time it was destroyed in A.D. 70, he was probably around 70 years old. Okay? So he would have, in my opinion, he would have already known what the measures would have been, the dimensions that it would have been. So this, this is not, a, not the second temple. It's a different one. It's the third temple. And it's been 1,947 years since the second one was destroyed. It's a long time. That's the longest they've ever gone without having a temple. And so they haven't had a temple. And for the first time in history, there are serious discussions and plans to rebuild a new Jewish temple, the third one. And it will happen. There's people who tell you it won't happen. They're wrong. It will happen. Now, we know that because, I'm so sure about that, because the Bible obviously says it will be built. And God's word is true. It's not a lie. Now, here's the question I would pose, a question I've thought about myself. Does God order the Jews anywhere in Scripture to rebuild a third temple? No, not that I'm aware of. Uh, will God give them some kind of prophetical word to rebuild it? Again, no, I don't think so. Um, and I think they will simply do it in their own minds out of necessity because they're so stuck in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and that's what they know, and they're going to try to go back to it because they know, even though they've, you, if you talk to them, they'll try to find a justification for only having synagogues, for not having a temple, they're having some other way for getting forgiveness from God besides what he's prescribed in the law of Moses. Um, they know in their heart of hearts they need a temple. They know, they sense the, that they're not in God's perfect will from their perspective without one. So they don't know what else to do. Since they refuse Jesus as their Messiah, they refuse to trust in him and move away from the old covenant into the new covenant, where will they get their forgiveness from? The qu another question be, is, when sacrifices are offered there after it is built, will God receive those sacrifices? No, he will not. Jesus was the final sacrifice for sins, according to scripture. And the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was done away with. Besides the fact, according to Hebrews, animal sacrifices are, uh, cannot truly take away the sins of the worshipers. They were never designed for that. They were simply a shadow of Jesus who is to come. And when the person who the shadow is coming from comes, you no longer need the shadow. I mean, think about it. If, if, if I'm sitting somewhere waiting for someone to come, and I see their shadow. I'm thinking to myself, well, he's almost here. He's almost here. Depending upon the, where the sun is and where he is in relation to it, it might take a little longer. Shadow might be a little bit longer. But as it gets closer and I see him, I don't care about the shadow any longer. The shadow means nothing to me. The person who brings the shadow is what means something to me. And uh, so they're going back to the shadow. It'd be like someone, me waiting for someone and continuing to walk away from that person and just look at their shadow. How foolish would that be? I'm not waiting for the shadow, I'm waiting for the person. The person has come. The shadow's done away with. And so Jesus, God's not going to receive these sacrifices because he's done away with them through Jesus Christ. If, if those animal sacrifices could forgive sin, why would they offer them year in and year out, day in and day out? Jesus Christ once for all time, good enough for all sins that will ever and have ever been committed to wash away your sins. Praise the Lord for that. As long as those sins are repented of, of course, as long as you truly trust in Christ who laid down his life for you, then you can receive true forgiveness of sins, not just a temporal reminder of those sins year in and year out. Uh, when the people attempt to worship God in the third temple, Will he receive their worship? No, he will not. 
They're not worshiping in him in spirit and in truth. And John 4 says the kind of worshipers God is seeking after are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's not even seeking after that kind of worship. He's not seeking after the kind of worship that goes back to the shadow, builds a building, and tries to worship God. Because we know the real temple now is us. You are the temple of the living God if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The presence of God dwells within you if you're a Christian. And so God's looking to see what your temple looks like. He's not looking to that temple any longer. So we see in these passages that God is simply telling us what will happen. It will be built. It's prophetical. And uh, from what I can see in Scripture, God tells not only that it will be built, but what it will look like and some things that will happen in it around it. But none of that means that God approves of it or that he claims a temple as his own. Like he's going to go into there, into the Holy of Holies. They're going to build a new Ark of the Covenant. He's going to have his presence dwell there between the angels and above the mercy seat. Not going to happen. Because the Holy Spirit does not dwell in temples made by man, man's hands. He dwells in a temple made by his hands. Because he knitted you together in, his, in your mother's womb. He desires to dwell in your temple. Not a physical temple. And the only reason he dwells in church meeting places is because he dwells in the people who meet there. And the people who meet there aren't truly Christians. He's not there. That's the way it works. Yet many of these Jews in this temple will be worshiping in an ignorant way according to the knowledge they have. And so many of them have been told so many lies about Christianity. So many lies about Jesus. And they've had so many bad experiences with professing Christians. I think God looks upon them mercifully. Not that he's forgiving them. Um, but, you know, the Apostle Paul said that God had mercy upon him because he did those things ignorantly. That's what it says. Uh, he didn't know what he was doing. That's why when he had the encounter with Jesus and the master, he said, who are you, Lord? He didn't know who he was. And I think a lot of the Jews in the third temple time, they're going to be a lot the same way. They're going to be the same way Paul was. They're going to have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Their hearts are hard, their necks are stiff, and their eyes are blind. And the scripture says that about them. And that's the way it's going to be for quite some time. But it's not our job to despise them. It's our job to persevere with them in telling them the truth, to provoke them to jealousy by our own devotion to the God they say they worship. The God they should be worshiping properly. We are worshiping properly. I should provoke them. Now, if you want to know more about this same temple, go to Ezekiel chapter 40. You read four chapters, chapter 40, 41, 42, and 43. It gives in painstaking details all the measurements of all the nooks and crannies of the temple. Okay? If you want to know that, you can go there. Because obviously, I mean, he's given a reed here, a rod here to measure, and he gives no measurements at all, does he? Nothing given here. But if you go to Ezekiel 40 through 43, four chapters of the Bible, you'll see it's not talking about the second temple. It's talking about a future temple. Even, even I mean, Ezekiel, he was before the second temple. But it's not talking about the temple they're about to build. You go read those passages, you'll see for yourself. And I mean, eventually we'll probably get to Ezekiel and talk more about those chapters. But if you want to read more about what it looks like, you can, I encourage you to read those four chapters. And as I already said, John was given a rod to, quote unquote, measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But what is John really measuring here? Is it possible that he is simply given a, you know, measuring rod to measure things in cubits or in inches or in centimeters or feet or whatever. Well, that's possible. But I think it goes beyond that. I mean, if you want to know the dimensions of the temple, all we can do is go to Ezekiel chapter 40, like I was saying, and read those four chapters. It tells every dimension you could hope for. In fact, I would predict, I don't think it's going to happen by accident with the third temple. I, I'm going to predict that the Jews will go to those chapters and make it exactly like it says there. They're going to use it as a blueprint. That's my, that's my prediction. I don't know what they're doing now, but it's going to be like that. That's the only temple left to be built. 
So if they don't do that, then it's going to happen by, by accident or by coincidence, whatever people want to say, or happen under the direction of God, even though God's not telling them to do it, because it's going to be exactly like that is. So if John it was using the rod given to him to actually physically measure the temple and all the dimensions of it, maybe it was just for him. Because he, like I said, he doesn't give us the measurements. So it would have to have been just for him, for him to know that it's the same temple as Ezekiel chapter 40 through 43. Um, yet even if John was only taking the measurement of the temple and the altar, well, how do, why would he take measurements of the people who worship there? Is he going up to uh, someone the same height as Brother Tracy and saying, oh, five foot ten, five eleven, whatever. <laughs> Something like Brother Kevin saying six foot two. Is he, is he going up to people? Is he going up to someone the same height and saying five foot two? I mean, is he doing those things? I mean, what, what would be the purpose of that? Oh, he's got a size 32 waist. You know, why would he be doing that? I don't think that's what God's telling him to do. And the word for measure here is not necessarily mean just that. It can mean that. That's the primary meaning of that word. But it also can mean measuring in a different way, like comparing to what it should be. Okay? And so I think what God really cares about and what John really cares about in this situation, not necessarily the dimensions of the temple, the altar, or the people worshiping there, what John really cares about is evaluating these situations, evaluating these people, evaluating the temple. Because what goes on in the temple? Worship. Sacrifices. And so he's going to go in there and analyze some things. He's going to check it out to see if it's what it's supposed to be. You see, John knew what true worship in a temple looked like. Because he went to the temple before Jesus came around and started the New Covenant. He knew what false worship looked like in the temple because he was around after the New Covenant was started and he went to the temple then as well. So he knew both sides of the story. And so he can go in there and check it out, see what it looks like, see how people are worshiping. And so literally I think John will be judging the activities of the temple and the people there in order that he might preach to them. He's given a sneak peek picture of what it will be like 1900 to 2000 years before he actually goes in there and preaches to them as one of the two witnesses. Imagine that. Imagine that, Brother Tracy. We, 1900 years ago, you and I are alive on the earth and God says, okay, here's a picture of what Beale Street will look like in 2017. This is what this sinner is going to be like. This is what they're going to look like as they're going in. I mean, how effective could our message be to know every nook and cranny about that event, to see what the people are going to be like and what their, because it really is worship there, what their worship will be like as well as they sing these wicked songs and what they're, I mean, we would be able to pinpoint, micro pinpoint what we would preach on and what our message would be like. And I think that's truly what's going on with John here. He's able to evaluate the temple itself, the activities going on there, the worshipers who are there, that he might preach more effectively to them when he comes as one of the two witnesses later on, if he does. I have to give that disclaimer because I, you know, I'm not still in 100% on that. I'm as 100% as I can be without actually being 100%. But, um, you know, when we preach to people, we want to preach to them. I don't want to preach over someone's head. I don't want to preach to some metaphorical person back there in the back that doesn't exist. I don't want to preach to someone who's never going to hear my message. I want to preach to people who actually are hearing my message. I want it to be pinpoint and get to their heart, get to their mind, that they might make a change as God sees fit for them to change. And that's what John and Elijah's calling will be as well, as they preach the gospel, they preach the word of God to the Jewish people and also the children of God beyond the Jewish people because there's going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be messages for us and they're preaching as well. And as, as was said to John when he ate the little book, you must speak, prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So they're going to speak to the people. They're the Jewish people. 
in a temple area, but they're also going to preach to a worldwide audience, probably through TV screens, be my guess, and computer screens and cell phone screens and whatever else screens there are available to project their message. I imagine they're going to have the most worldwide audience that's ever been for any preachers. It's amazing. I mean, we go to events, and I like to just, you know, these concerts, go up there and just grab the microphone for a second. They're going to have the whole world listening, captivated to hear their message. And as John goes up to measure the temple and the people in it, he is told not to concern himself with the outer court since the Jews won't be worshiping there. That's where the nations or the Gentiles will be. In other words, that's where all the non-Jews will be. And why will they be there? Why are they going to be in the outer courts? Uh, I mean, I don't know for sure, but what I would presume is this. So based upon our current knowledge of, that, of Jerusalem and that area, that, um, that, that the control of that area will not be under Jewish control. Um, just like you see a Temple Mount today. It's almost illegal for Jewish people to go up there. I mean, and when they go up there, they have to like, leave almost immediately. I told you about when I went there last June, how we waited a long time in a line to get up onto the Temple Mount. And we were at the top of the line. We thought they were going to shut it off completely because it was Ramadan, uh, Muslim you know, Holy Day. And they were very angry that anyone was coming up there. And we eventually got to go up there. We were up there for like maybe a minute or two, tops. We were ushered off as quickly as possible. The Muslims were foaming at the mouth, raging that we were even able to because we, were, we weren't Muslims. Uh, some of us were Christians, some of us were Jews. And I, I actually, uh, on Twitter, I follow the guy who is the leader of the Temple Institute. I have him as a follow there. And he, he's always sharing how Jews go up there and they get arrested for going up there and get arrested for things that, you know, Muslims would do 10 times worse than would get arrested. So I think it's going to be the same situation when the temple is built. Um, and not that I'm saying that the temple is going to be built on a temple mount, where people say it used to be. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the past. I don't think that's where the first two temples were. They were built on Gihon Spring, which is south of the temple mount. But no matter where it's going to be built, um, the, the, the Gentiles, the nations, whoever it may be, whether it's under Palestinian control or some kind of Muslim control or just United Nations control, European Union, whoever it may be, it's going to be under some kind of Gentile control. And so they'll have control, the Jews won't have control over that area in some way. Let's turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 20. Reading through verse 24. It says, But when you see Jerusalem, Jesus speaking, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But though, woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people, this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time, times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so it says there will be wrath upon this people. What people is it talking about? Jews. Jews, that's right. And this part right here, verses 20 and 24, is, is not talking about future, like future for us. It's talking about A.D. 70. How do we know this? Because verse 20 says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Matthew 24 says, when you see the abomination of desolation. Well, the abomination of desolation is, they're not surrounded by armies more. The armies in the city, in the temple. So completely different warning for completely different people. Luke 21, 20, 24, Christians would read that. Christians in the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, they read this, they saw the city surrounded by an army, and they left and got out safely. Because for some reason, that army backed away for a period of time, and then it came right back. And only the Christians knew that because only the Christians were reading the scriptures. Only the Christians had this word of God, which tells you what about Luke. This predates AD 70. 
okay, this word from God. And so, but we see in verse 24, and we see what happens to the Jewish people. They're going to be scattered among all the nations. There'll be vengeance upon them. Vengeance for what? For killing their Messiah? For killing the apostles? For killing witnesses who were sent to them to preach them the truth about their Messiah? Vengeance for that? And wrath upon this people? And they'll be, uh, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captains of all nations. And it's been that way until 1948 when they started coming back. But there were still some in there before then, but coming back in large amounts. And so Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The question is, did the time of the Gentiles end in 1948? The answer is no. They're still trampling Jerusalem to this day. They're still there especially Muslims, they're still there. Especially fake Christians, Roman Catholic idolaters, they're still there. And so I don't think the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled until Jesus returns. That's when it'll be fulfilled. Let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. So that's the way it's going to remain. They're going to continue to trample the city underfoot. In other words, have control over it desecrated in some way with their false religion, their idolatry, whether it's Roman Catholics or even the Orthodoxes are there that are idolatrous or their Muslims that are there are idolatrous. So Romans chapter 11, we'll start in verse 19. There's some good verses in here about uh, against once saved, always saved. Verse 19 says, you will say then, talking, he's talking to Gentiles here, you Gentiles will say then, Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they, Jewish people, because of unbelief, Jews were broken off. They didn't believe in their Messiah. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches of the Jews, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards you, goodness, if you continue... In his goodness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also. Talk about the Jews again. They do not continue in unbelief. Will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree. Which is wild by nature. And were grafted contrary to nature. Into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these who are natural branches. Be grafted into their own olive tree. For I do not desire brethren. That you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is part of the mystery being fulfilled too, that we see in chapter 10 of Revelation. Part of the mystery that when Jesus returns, what I believe this is saying, every Jew who is still alive, they're going to realize who he is right then. They're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're going to trust in their Messiah. It's all going to be opened up to them. Now, some are, they're understanding it now. Multitudes are understanding it now. And like it says here, if they do not continue in unbelief, they're able to be grafted in for God's able to graft them in again. And they're cultivated. And what does that mean? They're cultivated because they've had the history they have the whole Old Testament to know what is to come. They know their Messiah has come. And they just blinded themselves. And, of course, God gave them over to it as well. And that's why most of them are continuing in unbelief. And so there is revival pockets happening in the Jewish communities where people are trusting in Jesus. And that will continue to happen in small amounts, I believe. And I think there will even be a, a bigger revival at some point in time. But the biggest revival is going to happen when Jesus returns. They're going to understand it right there on the spot. And um, that's what I think it means. This is all Israel will be saved. Some people would have you believe, like I think even John Hagee would say this, that Jews are saved in a different way. They're automatically saved. This is nonsense. This is talking about when Jesus returns. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We see in Romans 11 if we look at it in the right light. Um, right now there's blindness as a whole to the Jewish people uh, for many different reasons. Uh, one is the 
So the hypocrisy among professing Christians, people like Martin Luther, the Catholic Church, things they've done throughout history and how that's been passed on to all the other Jewish lineage they've had from then, and just they hold on to it tight. I mean, I, I, was, I think I was telling Brother Kevin, I ran to this guy in Columbia Walmart recently. Just going there, doing my shopping real quick, trying to get it done real quick. I saw this guy walking with a yarmulke on his head and seat seats hanging off the corners of his garments. And I'm like, I was completely astonished. And so I tracked him down. I followed him, tracked him down, and I tried to give him a cross track. I said, are you a Jew? He said, yes, I'm a Jew. He said, normally I would stop and, and talk to you, but I'm kind of in a rush. He says, I work around here. And I tried to give him a cross track, and he looked at it and immediately rejected it because it was Jesus. He knew it was Jesus. He said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm strong with my faith. You know, whereas other people in other religions, they might sit there and talk to you. But there's a hardness there, a hardness of heart there, and blindness there. That they just, they refuse to see. And to some degree, they refuse to see. And to some degree, they just have a blindness upon them that God's given them over to. And so once the fullness of Gentiles has come in, which I think is going to be the very end, then their eyes will be open. They'll see their Messiah like they should. Like Joseph. Yeah. Joseph and his, yeah, Joseph and his, his brother, that's right. Their eyes will be opened. And so Jerusalem and the outer courts are given unto the Gentiles and to the end. And so we won't, uh, no matter what president comes into America, no matter what, how America acts, they'll, they'll never be complete Jewish control in Jerusalem until the very end when the Jew of Jews comes and takes control over it. And um, so that, that's when it's going to happen. So, um, yet in, in verse, we go back to Revelation for a second here. And it says in verse 2, you know, I'm, I'm saying they're going to have control over it until the very end. It says in verse 2, it says, um, they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Well, how does that comport with what I just said? Well, 42 months is three and a half years, based upon 30 day months, okay? which is what the Jewish calendar goes by, lunar cycles, not what we go by, okay? That's why they'll, sometimes they'll have to add a whole month to a calendar year, not just a half a day here, and then, oh, every fourth or quarter day here, and every fourth year we'll add a day to February. You know, they add a whole month sometimes. Um, so this, this is talking about, and we've talked about this before, this is talking about the first three and a half years to the last seven years, the first half of the last seven years. And... The reason why I think it's saying they will trample the Holy Spirit under foot for 42 months is because, first of all, John's going to be there for those 42 months. Those are the one part he's going to be there for. And secondly, at the end of those 42 months, when John and Elijah are put to death, they're killed, the Antichrist will commit the abomination of desolation in the temple itself, in the Holy of Holies. And the Gentiles no longer just tread the outer courts underfoot, they're trampling everything underfoot at that point. So that's why I think it's saying that there. That's the reason I think it's mentioning 42 months there, because John will be there for those 42 months. That's what it applies to him as he looks upon it. And secondly, they're going to trample the whole temple underfoot at the end of those 42 months. And so still, it's not like they're going to lose the outer court at the end of 42 months. They're going to have the whole thing at that point because of the abomination of desolation. <laughs> Okay, so just to kind of sum up today, uh, this temple is the third temple, which is going to be rebuilt, I think, according to the plans, Ezekiel 40 through 43, whether on accident or on purpose. Yet God has not called them to build this temple. God has not accepted this as his temple. We are the temple of God, if you're a Christian. He's not going to accept the worship there, the sacrifices there, yet he's telling us it's going to happen. And um, John has given a read to measure the temple, the altar, and the people there to evaluate, to assess what is going on there because he will be preaching to those people along with preaching to the rest of the world. And um, the holy city is given to Gentiles until the very end. The time of the Jews will be in the very end when the Jew of Jews comes and takes control of Jerusalem completely and all of the promised land and the whole earth as the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay, so I'll open up the floor to, to questions, objections, or things you want to add.
Interesting. They can't get away, but they must answer the question. I have to look into that. That's true. I'll have to do it next time. <laughs> Make them late for work. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck here now, man. Yeah. What does Isaiah 53 mean? <laughs> answer that question. Yeah, that's a, something I heard. So Interesting. I have research for myself, but yeah. that's, that's what I heard. Interesting. We can talk about it more, but uh, in chapters 40 through 43, it's like there's a lot of verses, and I'm listening, I'm, I'm going back and forth as you're, as you're mm-hmm. teaching. I feel like there's, there's a lot of verses that seem to That that this this is something that the Lord's involved in, but it's probably something you could you could dig into more. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I was just going through the verses. Probably not something you just want to do at a just on a glance. You know, mm-hmm. probably dig in more. But like forty three four, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate, which faces toward the east. Uh, right. When is that happening? Well, yeah, you could say that would be when the Lord returns. Yeah. But there's there's some verses that that seem to speak about how this place is holy. This place is holy. This is the holy garments. The sacrifice is holy. That seems like there's verses before that in forty and up to you know up to that point mm-hmm. that seem to say that the, this this temple is is holy. Mm-hmm. That the the uh, the angel here that's describing these things is describing it that way. Yeah. But probably something we could probably go in, you know, separately go through, go through all those. And yeah, I, I don't see personally. I mean, based upon all the scripture, interpreting scripture, scripture, how it could be holy while God has done away with the old covenant. Yeah, I don't see it either. That's why I was. Yeah. I, I don't. Well, I can't say I understand it like right now, even as I'm reading these mm-hmm. verses. Yeah. Seems like something, uh, but I don't understand it completely. So, sure. because of course I understand the believers, mm-hmm. but how it connects yeah. with the. To me, it's got to be either a timing issue, you know, because it's going to be holy eventually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. G- God is going to walk into it. Right. Jesus is going to walk through. I mean, you read on in Ezekiel, he walks through the Eastern Gate. I mean, that's what it says. So. It's going to be holy eventually, but I, I don't believe that God is esteeming their sacrifices, of course, like I was saying earlier. Um, and it could, it could mean set apart or holy in this sense, that, that it's set apart for God to come into. That it's holy in that sense. Because holy doesn't always mean like pure, or necessarily accepted by God. It's, it's set apart, and he's going to come into it. So it could be set apart in that way. Like maybe just look at a few. So do you think that but, it's built in a millennium or it's built beforehand and then this is talking about what happens during that? It, obviously, Book of Revelation puts a temple there. Right, but I'm, but I'm saying, I guess you could say, I don't think there's any really credence to this. You could say, though, that the temple that was built, the third temple, was destroyed by God when he comes back and he puts another one in its place. Okay. But what I'm saying is, if, if this is a temple that, that's third temple built, Maybe 40 through 43 is talking about activity after Jesus returns, but it's still describing the dimensions because God doesn't change the dimensions of it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's doing. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be, yeah. that could be it. describing it, but this, then, then all these activities here yeah. are actually the activities that will take place in the millennial yeah. reign. Um, and, and the question becomes then, of course, well, why are sacrifices being offered there? Not for forgiveness of sins, obviously, but maybe a memorial to God? Be like in Isaiah, Honoring to God? Of, I think the last chapter of Isaiah has 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. where the ministering temple. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Like 41, 41.4. Either way, you would say if this activity in Ezekiel 40 through 43 is talking about what's going on in millennial reign because the language used here, you would say it's still the same building that was used before the millennial reign. That's the part I'm not fully. Okay. Uh, fully, okay. Uh, It's both. Verse nine, verse nine says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last, seven last place came to me and talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. The bride, the lamb's wife, is believers, 
Right, but see, it can't be at the second coming. Why can't it? Well, because here we have a temple, right? Mm -hmm. And he just described how there's a temple service done during the millennial reign, which comes after the second coming. Mm -hmm. And then later on, talking about the same temple, uh, down in uh, verse 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Okay, but let's, let's go back to verse 9 for a second. Who is the bride, the Lamb's wife? Well, I, I agree with that part. Okay, so the, how can this not be the second coming then? Well, if it was the second coming, then what uh, Brother Kevin said has to happen during the glory of rain can't be true. No, I don't, I, don't believe that's, I don't believe that's true. Because that's a temple that would be in the city. Right. He says there is no temple. Yeah, there's probably another way around that, though. Um, I wasn't prepared to answer that question today, but you know, we've talked about this before, about whether there's a temple in the city or not, and what that means. We've talked about it before, so um, I don't have the answer to that right now off the top of my head. I wasn't prepared to answer the question in verse 22, but uh, I, I still hold fast to verse 9 being us. And then it says in verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain to show me the great city, to holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. So he says, come, let me show you the bride and the Lamb's wife, and then he shows them a great city coming down from heaven. Right. Well, that's got to be the second coming. Well, can't that also take place after the millennial reign? Why would it be back in the sky? Because God wants it that way. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, it seems like it's, it's so similar to what uh, would actually happen. So you're, you're saying that in no new Jerusalem until after a thousand years. I'm saying that this right here being described as a city is an actual city that has walls, has gates, has... Uh, oh, I don't have a problem with that part, but... And, and it's actually going to descend after the millennial reign because it says there's no temple therein, whereas during the millennial reign there would be a temple. Okay, so if you go back to verse 20, we get to take a look at the context. Verse 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 21, verse 1, I'm sorry. A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there's no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the city and the people contained in it are synonymous. Just like you see in like Matthew 23, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's not talking about the physical dirt in Jerusalem. He's talking about the people in Jerusalem. He says that. Um, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be them and be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So we're talking about when God returns to tabernacle with men, when Jesus returns. This is all happening at the same time. New heaven, new earth. The bride prepared for a husband coming down out of heaven from God. It's all talking about the same thing that verse 9 and verse 10 is talking about. Just giving greater detail, we're starting in verse 9. For the same things that happen. And so every tear will be wiped away from our eyes, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All those things pass away. New heaven and new earth come all at the same time as the second coming of Jesus Christ and us coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her, her husband. It's all happening at the same time. So there's another way around verse 22. I don't have it off the top of my head, and I can't prove it to you right now. But I've looked into this a little bit, and there's another way around it. So I, I don't have the answer for it right now, but there's too many things in, the, in chapter 21 to lead me to believe that this is talking about anything but the second coming at this point in time. So, yeah, the city coming down from heaven, I agree with that, but it's also the people in, contained in the city. We're coming down at the same time. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, all at the same time as the second resurrection. Yeah. And there's no temple in, in it. Yeah. But in New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem. No. Right. But that doesn't mean not a temple at all. Huh? That doesn't mean it's not a temple at all. Right. That doesn't mean, that, doesn't mean necessarily, right, that there's no temple at all other than that just in the New Jerusalem there's not a temple. Yeah. That's so specific. I follow. Well, no, I'm, just, I'm not trying to make it complicated. I'm just saying in the New Jerusalem there's no temple. Correct. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. But uh, so, that's, that's not the whole earth, though. New Jerusalem doesn't cover the whole earth. No, I, I wouldn't think it'd cover the whole earth. Yeah, that's, that's what he's saying. There could be a temple on the earth without it being in the New Jerusalem. Well, it says here that the reason why there's no temple therein is because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. 
Sure. So there's no necessity for a temple anywhere on earth because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Well, I, I think that's going beyond what the passage is saying. No, I think it's exactly what the passage is saying. It says, uh, I saw no temple in it. What is it talking about? Well, the reason why there's no temple in it is because God's the temple. But what is the it? The city. What city? In Jerusalem. Okay, that's all, that's all he's saying. Why would it be on the other side of the planet? Well, I didn't say that. I'm yeah. saying why would it be somewhere else? I don't know. I'm just telling you what the passage says. Yeah, I'm not, we're not, we're not, I'm not saying that, that you know, it's, it's not worth looking, it's worth looking into and digging into. I'm just saying that, that it specifically is saying there's no temple. So, so it's worth to, to diving in and digging in deeper, right? I mean, to, to see if what's speaking of in Ezekiel, uh, how it relates to this, because it, it, you know, how, regarding the New Jerusalem having the temple in it, could that, could that Ezekiel temple not be in the, new, in the actual New Jerusalem? Because, that, you know, it's, it's specifically the same. It's not the same. Yeah, I don't know if I would agree with that. I think we should just table the discussion. To sure, yeah, yeah. Better answer. Oh yeah, yeah. That's what I, I mean. think. It's I, I I don't understand it fully myself. Right. That's why I said I mean it's worthy of digging in deeper. Like right. we'll probably not come come to a conclusion right now and say this is what it is. Like I I'm at I'm at the point where I would say I don't I don't know and I don't fully understand the Lord. You know what I mean? I don't fully understand, and so it's worth kind of digging in deeper and. You know, seeking the Lord and studying it a little deeper. Right. The only thing I'm saying is that when you read the verse uh, where it says the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple, sure. Then that shows that there's no necessity for a building. There's no necessity for the temple even to exist. Well, there's no necessity even for to exist. At there's that no time. necessity for it to be built before the Lord returns either. Well, right? I mean, Scripture says it. No, but wait, no necessity. Like worship for worshiping God. I mean, the, the sacrifices aren't going to fail. No, I, I agree with that. But it, it, it does have to exist as far as it, as far as the scripture is saying it does have to exist. But but the, I, I guess the the point being made here is that you can't just focus on one verse and dismiss all the rest of the verses. I mean, we go to Ezekiel forty forty three. He made some good points about them being holy, about the Lord entering it. If that's just a temple that's before Jesus returns, I don't I don't agree that it's holy. I don't agree that the glory of the Lord is in it. And so there's some good points being made there. So we can't just take one verse and say, this is what it is. We have to take all the scriptures, make sure we understand it completely and fully. And I don't have the answers right now, but I've, I've studied about this verse on verse 22, and I did come to different conclusions on that at some point in time. I don't have all the information right now. I didn't, I didn't think I was going to have to answer those kind of questions right now. So I, we, we should just table discussion for now. And let's study it some more. Uh, and, um, and that's it. I don't think verse 22 is the answer. Any more than I think focusing on Ezekiel 40, 43 is the answer. Or focusing on uh, you know, any other verses. Is it, we're going to combine them all together uh, yeah, to make it some, coherent. Some harmony, harmony to it all. Just to keep this open, yeah. um, because we do believe that um, eschatology is uh, on a time basis. That's time release basis as we get closer to End, it's possible we may not have an answer mm -hmm. for this. It might be something that God is not revealing yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave that as a possibility too, because I don't want to fall into a trap of now we have a problem, now we have something we have to solve, we have to figure out, and we have to put the puzzle pieces together to make it make sense. So many people have done that with eschatology, and that's why there's so much garbage out there. Uh, so we need to just make sure we're humble enough to say, well, I've looked at it, I've looked at it, the Lord's not revealing anything to me. I can't answer that question. So we need to leave that option open as well. Sure, yeah. That would yeah. be looking at both and saying, you know, there's there's obviously something here I don't fully understand. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study and seek you, Lord, and come to that best understanding that we can. And At the same time, we, we could possibly come to an understanding. We could. Too. I'm just saying that we have to yeah. leave that option open because sure, of course. don't even leave that option open. Yeah. Sure. Praise God, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit now. Amen. Praise God for that. That's what I was, that's what I, I was uh, sharing yesterday, like all, in the last few days, all day long. Because I had Mark 11, 17 on what I made. And uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Um, and so, you know, the Lord overturned the tables there. And, you know, but you've made it a den of peace. And so I was sharing with people encouraging prayer for the nations. They say there's there's no there's no temple. I was telling them there's no temple in 
you. Well, should prayer stop for the nations? And so now we're temples of the Holy Spirit. You're, temple, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the house of prayer, man. We're the house of prayer now for all nations to intercede. For yeah. The gospel to go forth in all nations. Was, so the Lord, the Lord had me uh, sharing that over and over and over again the last few days. Amen. And so that's that's one thing we know for sure right now. 